All right, well, uh, we are back uh, with our special correspondent for uh, Imran Khan Affairs, uh, Vikas Ahmed. Welcome back, Vikas. Uh, Thank you for having me, Justin. There's that famous quote that, you know, I think it's from Lenin or somebody that says, you know, there are years when nothing much happens, and then there are weeks when years worth of events happen. Yeah. Uh, and today we've got, uh, you know, obviously the main reason I engaged you last week was to talk about the attempted assassination against Imran Khan, which we'll get to. But there was a, a successful, I suppose, assassination of a very prominent Pakistani journalist in Kenya, Arshad Sharif, a TV journalist. Uh, yeah. And uh, I guess this was... This was before the attempt on Imran Khan. Yeah, it was before October the attempt. October twenty third. Yeah. Uh, so, what's the what, what is this case? Uh, who is Ar Arshad Sharif? What's what's this up? What was the nature of this operation? Arshad Sharif is a senior journalist. He has worked for Reuters. He has worked for Dawn, and uh, then he joined ARY. He has been the most famous uh, TV anchor on AR by AR by the top rated channel news channel okay. in Pakistan. He is the person who broke stories about the former Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif. He has broken stories about uh, money laundering. It's a very in-depth, very good investigation on money, money laundering of uh, current Prime Minister Shahbaz Sharif. Right. Uh, and he was exposing a lo lot of things about this regime change operation that has happened in Pakistan. He is someone who was close to Pakistani military establishment previously. And when uh -huh. this whole thing happened, when this split between the Pakistani military establishment and the Pakistani government and Imran Khan happened, uh, he took the side that was against the military establishment. And since he was an insider, he knew a lot of things about them. And that is why his, his uh, journalism was so effective. That is why they were after him. They chased him out of the country. He had to flee Pakistan. There were 16 cases registered against him throughout Pakistan. And these cases were of treason and sedition, which carry a uh, punishment of death in Pakistan. So he had to escape all of these things. He ran away to Dubai. From Dubai, the Pakistani authorities talked to the Dubai authorities and Dubai authorities forced him to leave Dubai, even though he had valid visa. And he did not have any other visa at that time. There are very few places in the world where Pakistanis can go without visa and Kenya is one of them. So he went to Kenya and uh, after a month or so living there, he was uh, killed, shot under mysterious circumstances. The Kenyan uh, police claimed responsibility and say, said that they have killed him uh, in a case of mistaken identity. He thought they thought he was someone else. But now, yesterday, his post-mortem report that was conducted in Pakistan after his bo dead body came to Pakistan, uh, his post-mortem revealed that his fingers were broken, his nails were removed, and he was brutally tortured for three hours before he was murdered. So there was no case of mistaken identity. This was a targeted assassination. Uh. Yeah, I mean, there. I, when when you when we just talk, we're talking about this off mic. I I remembered a case uh, from Toronto of a Balochistan, uh, you know, separatist uh, student activist named Karima Baloch Karima Mahrab, uh, who was killed about two years. I mean, you know, they said it was a suicide, but it was like prominent exile member of you know a separatist organization and and not the only one there was a, a Swedish uh case of another Baloch journalist who was also murdered about six months or so before that yeah. so it's uh yeah there are clearly like Pakistani intelligence operations of assassinations abroad uh you know Pakistan's not the only country that does this uh Rwanda. I know Rwanda has killed a bunch of people in Kenya. Russians actually. kill people all the time, also, like Putin's. Who? Yeah, Putin? Russians. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, Americans do it, yeah. <laughs> you know, on camera <laughs> right? in Pakistan. Yeah, but too. this this one case, we previously thought that Pakistanis do not have the capability, maybe, or that they, they yeah. do not have the ability to reach outside Pakistan. And all of the things that previously happened, for example, Karima Baloch. Uh, it looked like a natural death. It looked natural. Yeah. So there, what, what, even though there were suspicions, they were not like as uh, prominent. Yeah. 
now this Arshad Sharif's death put all of the previous deaths into question. Even if someone, yeah. Pakistani yeah. activist, has died of natural causes, we should yeah. now start suspecting that. Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, it, it, this one, you know, the, the, the story I'm looking at is CNN uh, from yesterday afternoon, and it talks about, it, it's an unnamed, in, uh, no, no, it's not unnamed. It's the Pakistani interior minister who actually is accusing the Kenyan police of not cooperating with their team. So this is also another uh, sign that, you know, there's a some kind of breakdown between whoever's running these operations uh, abroad and the government and such. Yeah. And no, this is completely dishonest, dishonest from the Pakistani interior minister. And oh, okay. Also- yeah, okay. because for for the longest time, uh, when they thought so, they thought that there's going to be no autopsy in Pakistan. Ah, this is the I see. There there was an autopsy in Kenya. That autopsy allegedly rules that there's no foreplay. It's a case of mistaken identity. Case okay. closed. His body was put in a box. The box box was nailed shut, and that was brought into Pakistan. They were going to bury him at right. the last minute. So this is like eyewitness account. At the last minute, his family insisted that we will not be- let the government bury him unless we have a second autopsy. Oh. So this second autopsy revealed all these uh, wow. of the broken bones and broken fingers. This would have been this would have never been discovered, and the government was t- till the end of it till the second autopsy report was finalized. routine vlogs and everything he has been lying throughout of all this right. like there are things they can get away outside of pakistan because pakistani people are not watching and kenya is like the only country in the world that is dependent on pakistan they're like right. m- maximum amount like the pakistan is their biggest export partner so all of their wow. exports they go they go to pakistan if wow. pakistan puts sanctions on kenya right now their whole economy will collapse wow. so this is pretty straightforward so, and the fact that Pakistani government did not pressurize the Kenyan government for the longest time till yesterday, till this till this postmortem report came out. Now they've changed their statements. Wow. Um, so so it's not a it's not a case of like some kind of covert operation that the government is unaware of, more just they're they're part of the cover up too. It yeah. seems like. Yeah. Yeah. And um, now that they've been unable to cover up, the things have started to come out. So he was killed on the 23rd. On yeah. the 21st uh, of October was when Imran Khan was uh, disqualified from holding office, I believe. Yeah. Another legal maneuver, um, well, you know, which is, I, I guess, does that decision still stand? Is he still technically uh, not allowed to? We're not sure, actually. Uh, this has never been cl- clarified. He. I, I think his disqualification is only for this term. It's not a lifetime disqualification. So uh, he's already going to resign for whatever seats he has won. So that disqualification is meaningless. He will um, be able to contest next ele- elections. <laughs> Assuming they have them. So, so uh, the, uh, the 28th, another big date, which was when there was a, one of the biggest, I guess the biggest rally so far. I mean, in a lot of ways, the, the, one of the big stories that we're not hearing about is just the size and scale of these rallies. Uh, but this was the biggest one yet. We should talk about that. These things have been increasing and in, like the Imran Khan's popularity has been on the rise since April. If we go back to April and if we go back to where it all started from, uh, allegedly the Pakistani army chief, uh, Kamar Javed Bajwa, was given uh, a survey that that showed him that Imran Khan's popularity is at all time low, which was true. You know, he went through like this COVID and all like bad economy and everything. But that did not, you know, that's a that's a limitation of survey because the survey was checking his popularity. The survey was not testing what would be the people's reaction be if he's forcibly removed by the military. Because right. when that happened, then then the, everything like all hell broke loose. Then it, the night of April tenth was one of the biggest lead, leaderless 
leaderless process, uh, uh, protests we've seen in the history of Pakistan. And since that day, it has it has continuously gone up. The government, the military thought that this popularity will stop. They, they, they spread propaganda. He, they spread uh, like religious propaganda against him. They uh, provoked religious sentiments against him. They tried everything. They spread fake corruption stories against him. Nothing worked which culminated in like the, on the 28th, he was so popular that he was naming names, that names that have never been named before in Pakistani history. He was naming military generals. He was he was saying that these are the people who are behind our Shishiri's murder. These are the people who are stripping and torturing activists and, and senators. You know, they've been yeah. horrible. This past six to eight months have been so bad. There's this one senator, they stripped him, they took his videos, and then then they also like made a secret video of him and his wife, and they sent that video to their daughter. These are the things that have been unheard of in Pakistani history. So by, by this time, by the 28th, Imran Khan had started naming names, and he had become extremely dangerous because you could not stop his popularity, you could not stop his narrative. There was only one option left, and that was to murder him. Right. So I guess now, yeah, we can talk about the uh, the assassination attempt, uh, November 3rd. Uh, I guess uh, a gunman, they show a video of the gunman confessing right after. And he said he insisted that he acted alone. He looks like a fairly not, uh, you know, not, let's, let's just say he's not, he's not Jason Bourne, right? He's uh, <laughs> no. So yeah, well, what's what's going on there? What's that? Uh, okay. What's yeah. There? So uh, this is the most compliant gunman. There are so many holes in this this whole yeah. thing, but I I walk over like how it all went down. So uh, Imran Khan was uh, is doing this march. He was going from Lahore on uh, on his container to Islamabad, and this was the main movement against the government. They were going to go to Islamabad. They're going to shut Islamabad down. It was like it was months in the making. Um, while Imran Khan was midway there, like not even midway, like one third of the way there, he was standing on top of the container. It's a bulletproof container from the, like if you're inside it, but if you're standing on top of it, you're exposed. So he was standing on top of the container. There are people all around him. Suddenly one guy pulls out a gun from his uh, pocket. There's another person, and this is caught on video. There's another person standing next to him and he sees this guy, guy taking gun out. So he stops him. He take, pulls, pushes his hand down. And in this commotion, he shoots 10 bullets. And he shoots, and another person comes to help, and th that person is shot. So that one person dies immediately. And these 10 bullets are shot towards Imran Khan. There's, you know, there, there's no, uh, no one exactly aiming. This guy, this gunman, He's not, it, it later turns out he's not a great gunman. He doesn't have any gun fighting training. He, so he's not really aiming at the place. As he goes down, he's captured. There's another gunman, another volley of bullets go, go towards Imran Khan. And some of those bullets hit a plate right in like a metallic plate right in front of Imran Khan. And the sharpness from that uh, bullet and the plate, they go into uh, Imran Khan's legs. So there are like four bullet fragments in his legs. And the second shooter was never caught. So there's like, and this is where the story gets mysterious because the first shooter then is immediately taken to a police station. The police station that is not in that precinct. So it's not the area police station. He's taken to a police station far away. We don't know by whom, right? This is, even though this is Imran Khan's government in Punjab, it, it is being so controlled by the military that Imran Khan can't do anything. So this guy is taken to another police station. In that another police station, he sits on a cushy chair and he he says that he was acted alone and there's nobody else. And he, he gives a statement and not even in 20 minutes. This is unprecedented. Uh, you know, gunmen do not come on TV to, you know, have their podcasts and stuff in any other current country in the world. So after this first statement, the very next, like, like in, in an hour or so, the government of Punjab suspends the entire police station for this breach of, you know, whatever, the uh, procedures. Yeah. Yeah. But as soon as this whole police station is suspended, 
another video comes out and now this guy is sitting in some other nice cushy office and then he gives a more elaborate statement he he uh, talks about the religious how his religious sentiments were hurt and how he acted alone he's not being told by anyone to shoot so apparently as it turns out this was a guy who was going to take the fall of the whole thing the second guy was going to be the sharpshooter but the thing the bad thing that happened the the, the reason this plan got foiled was their timing got off this guy shot a second too early so this gave imran khan the chance to duck and miss the other bullets that have hit him on the front because they they came from a height they were like houses right all around imran khan so the other gunman according to multiple eyewitnesses was sitting on the roof of one of the houses so once imran khan is moving i guess you know the the assassination is planned for a static target that's just standing there giving a speech or whatever yeah so I mean, you know, if it's legit, so here's here was why I freaked out uh, when that happened, which is like I watched, uh, you know, I, the the Benazir Bhutto, you know, story, and you know, of course, Imran Khan is different in the sense that he's not from one of these families, the Bhuttos and the Sharifs and the um, Sardaris, yeah, but. But uh, but Bhutto, you know, she was in exile for a long time. She made some deal to come back. So in, in, she returns in October 2007 and almost right away, there's a big bombing where there's yeah. like 150 people killed huge bombs um, trying to assassinate her. And then they don't uh, succeed. But then two months later, she's gunned down. Yeah, uh, as soon as she gets out. So uh, it was. I, I just got this feeling like they're gonna just keep going until they succeed. Yeah. And so you know, the, the, this kind of like one assassination attempt is just like, you know, it's it just shows you that this is their plan. And like yeah. if they're do they're doing these other assassinations everywhere in the world, uh, and they clearly don't see any way to win this one politically. So this is a very, very dangerous uh, period we're entering. Um, yeah. No, this could, uh, like, let's see what's common between Benazir's assassination and this Imran Khan's assassination attempt. Uh, when Benazir came back to Pakistan, she made a deal with Pervez Musharraf. And Pervez Musharraf had specific conditions about the deal, uh, like what Benazir was supposed to do and what she was not supposed to do. But the thing that is in common is Pervez Musharraf was a military general who did not want to leave power. Right now, Kamar Javed Bajwa is a military general who does not want to leave power. And to stop, like to, to hold on to power, they have to create certain conditions. And those were the conditions that Musharraf created for Benazir. Musharraf told Benazir that, you know, I'm going to stay out of uniform and like they had a deal and Benazir was supposed to behave a certain way. When Benazir came to Pakistan, she stopped listening to Musharraf. She broke her end of the deal. So Musharraf and Musharraf saw her as a, as a threat because at that time, Benazir was the most popular person in Pakistan. And when someone is really popular, first you try to like hurt their popularity and if you fail at that which Musharraf failed continuously because at that time when Benazir came back Musharraf was in like the last years of his tenure he had already ruled Pakistan for like almost a decade so that meant people were fed up of him there was no way that people could have chosen Musharraf over Benazir and Musharraf could see that and when he saw that Benazir was not following through with her end of the deal he decided to remove her from the way what also happened after Benazir was immediately, after Benazir was murdered, was uh, Zardari, her husband, became president. And we see that Zardari did not pursue cases against Benazir, which is very unfortunate, even though he was her husband and he was the president immediately after Benazir, he did not pursue those cases. Like he didn't try to, to figure out who was behind the assassination, yeah, he did not get them it. punished and so yeah. on. Yeah. He was sort of like satisfied by getting Musharraf out and being in power yeah. himself. That yeah. was like that's his it. revenge or whatever. Yeah. 
Yeah, and they, that is a very popular saying that PPP people say democracy is the best revenge. But <laughs> uh, justice is also a pretty good revenge, which Benazir never got. Yeah. yeah. So uh, with, the difference with Imran Khan is Imran Khan does not have any family you can sell him out. He does have like a bunch of turncoats and like bad politicians around him, which is like par for the course of Pakistani politics. But the main strength behind him is the people. So immediately after Imran Khan was shot, there people started moving towards the military installations. This has never happened in Pakistan. They started moving towards Lahore camp. They started moving towards GHQ. And they started protesting in front of them. And military soldiers came out for the first time in Pakistani history face to face with the protesters. And that's like, thank God nothing happened. Imran Khan was safe. If anything had yeah. happened to Imran Khan, there would have been bloodbath on the streets of Pakistan. That is why so many people say that the guy who saved Imran Khan, the guy who, you know, tackled the shooter, he actually saved he Pakistan. Saved Pakistan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, but I mean, you know, the, then the, the key question is, does, you know, to what extent does the establishment understand that? Because if they don't, uh, you know, if um, unless there was something really surprising in the people's reaction, they are likely to try again. So, you know, they it, it, the thing is, it's not they. It's it's fragmented. The yeah. people who we think are this monolithic entity, the Pakistani establishment. If yeah. we look closely, there are it is also fragmented. It is internally also divided. If someone from within them goes too far and bring disrepute to the whole institution. Some like other like people who lose out because of this one man's hubris might speak out, which is what happened the first time when you know, when the um, assassination was attempted against Imran Khan. We saw uh, yesterday there was a core commander conference, and they in very clearly like all the other generals in very clear terms told General Bajwa that there is no way that he can stay on like he cannot. We be he cannot get another extension. He cannot be the army chief anymore. He has to go out on time now. Wow. This is one thing that is that might possibly stop them from attempting the assassination again. Had this not happened, I would say there's a hundred percent chance that they would try to kill him again because the crimes that they have committed within within the last eight months are so big that. Four or five Pakistani generals can be tried and can be hanged. Right. You know, the crimes include torture, the crimes include murder, the crimes include treason. These are not small crimes. And it's like when when situation becomes like it's survival for both Imran Khan. It's either Imran Khan or it is them. Exactly. And if it is, Imran Khan is alive, he will not leave them alone. So it's a very no urgent yeah. need for de-escalation. So, so the idea is if they if they force Bajwa to step down on schedule, then he has less to gain from you know, yeah from murdering. There's nothing to gain. Yeah, and they, they, he might he might ask for a way out, and yeah. like pragmatically, maybe at least till he is in power, he should be allowed some way out, and the cases can be pursued later. But right now, Pakistan was in clear danger of martial law there's another theory that was circulating in pakistani politics like it was that if a situation is created in which imran khan is murdered or like there's blood on the streets then the pakistani military which basically meant pakistani the chief of army staff bajwa would come in and declare martial law and be in power for five more years yeah had this happened, had Imran Khan would have died, this would definitely have happened. And uh, Pakistan would have been thrown back into the 80s all over again. Yeah. But but thankfully, it did not happen. Wow. Yeah, that would I would advise against that uh, if I was advising Bajwa. But I mean, I would advise him against so many things that he, have, he has done. He's already done. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, there's a kind of an amazing uh, article that I saw, uh, I guess, came out today uh, mm -hmm. in Dawn. Uh, and it's an interview by someone named Atika Rehman. Atika uh, Rehman, she's a journalist for Dawn. 
I think yeah. you're right. About. And Don has been, uh, from what I could tell, fairly hostile to Imran Khan. Like, it hasn't been especially pro Imran Khan, but mm. this was kind of an interesting, like, an interview. With... Altika is really good, actually. Okay. So, like, we can't make instant, like, judgments about the whole institution. Right. The previous editor for Don mm. is now in the current government. He's the advisor to the prime minister. So I that see. could tell you something about like the institutional policy. But right. within the institution, there are you know individuals who try to do their jobs honestly and who are competent enough. Atika is one of them. And this interview, this is a good interview. It's a good interview, and it's it's yeah. just like uh, you know, if you're if you're in journalism school, you know, <laughs> this is how to do it, right? Because yeah, there's a, you know, so you, it starts off uh, it describes there are at least three dozen personnel from the provincial police force stationed on the narrow lane leading to Imran Khan's Zaman Park residence these days. But inside, the PTI chairman cuts a lonely figure. Um, on Tuesday, all, other than the lawyer at Zahsan, who was escorted to the gate, uh, not a single face from the 2018 election coterie or the usual suspects is at the scene. Um, lawyers, journalists, and security officials came and went, but only when cleared. No phones were allowed. Security, serious business. Uh, I mean, it's just really well written. Shows the picture. You know, you see what what she's trying to do. Uh, I'm yeah. relieved to be alive. He says. Um, so they start with that quote. What's really interesting, though, is he talks about it's a very frank interview, right? I mean, he says mm -hmm. he kind of breaks down the fact that the National Accountability Bureau was controlled by the army, he not by him, uh, and the issue of uh, of Alim Khan. Uh, can you do you, what's this you know if, if for in, for beginners <laughs> can you do this uh this issue of the chief minister i mean we we've, we've actually talked about it you and me in previous yeah. videos but but let's just just go over the maybe both of these issues because these are the two issues that he says were the the break with uh yeah with uh with the army yeah before i talk about this specific issue we should understand how pakistani politics uh, pakistani like economics yeah. and politics and business works yeah. pakistan is based on a, a like it's elite capture in pakistan it's a system based on taking uh, from the taxpayer and giving it to the elite so pakistan has few big industries it is agriculture and then textile but in, in within agriculture there's cotton and there's uh, sugar cane these are big businesses in pakistan all the people who own these big businesses, they're also in the parliament. And all and, and all these people get uh, subsidies from the government. If someone is in real estate, real estate, they will get really cheap lands from the government. This is a system. Alim Khan is a real estate guy. So like real estate is also like one of the biggest businesses in Pakistan. So in real estate in Pakistan works like you get huge amount of land allotted from the government for extremely low prices because it's taxpayers land nobody cares and then you can sell it to people for extortionate prices and everyone makes money in it and the government would not sell this land this like large pieces of lands uh to anyone you have to bribe government officials which is where alim khan comes in alim khan is one of those people who would bribe government officials get large amount of land and then sell it to people make tons of money there is no investment required in this racket so the army chief his um his son's father in law is also one of these real estate magnates so they're all involved in this lahori and punjab real estate business and alim khan was supposed to you know be the chief minister had he become the chief minister he would have taken such huge amounts of land and he would have sold it all over the place and he would have paid money to everyone which is why army chief wanted him to be the chief minister of punjab imran khan instead of putting him in like chief minister of punjab he put a guy who is like you would call him a simpleton he's basically he would do nothing he would he was just the proxy for imran khan in punjab that is how imran khan controlled punjab if you remove that guy then punjab falls into chaos like because everyone's fighting for power in there he was a simple guy he would go to his work do whatever imran khan says and then that was it bajwa wanted that guy removed wanted this cunning uh corrupt politician and he had cases against him so imran khan didn't want him in place that was one of the issues 
And then, and then the other thing was the National Accountability Bureau. So yeah. this is like a, a an anti corruption measure. And I guess this also comes into like trying to preemptively. So a lot of these countries that are allies of the U.S. Uh, do a lot to try to try to fight corruption because the U.S. has all these laws that enable them to arrest yeah. foreign you know businesses and foreign politicians. This was corruption. actually started by Musharraf. Yeah. And the intentions behind this was were okay, but I I don't we, I can't actually talk about intentions. Before yeah. Musharraf, <laughs> right. Right. before Musharraf came into power, Nawaz Sharif started this accountability drive. In the nineties, Pakistani politics was so dirty that right. it, it is called the the dark era of Pakistani polit Pakistani economy because Pakistani <laughs> economy was completely no, bad. No offense, but there's not a lot of bright. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the 90s were especially the bad. 90s, at, yeah. In the 90s, we didn't have social media. We didn't have any right. means of information. There was one TV channel and that was controlled by the government. Right. So there was no TV, there was no social media, and you could get away with everything. And the way you would get away with everything is so laughable because Zardari, who at that time was the um, husband of the prime minister, yes. he would take these big bribes openly. Every yeah. deal that happened in Pakistan, it, it, it would go through Zardari. Mr. There's even Mr. stories Mr. of... Yeah, he, he, at that time, he was called Mr. 10 person. There's even a story about Zardari tying a bomb to someone's leg and extorting oh, yeah. him for money, making him go to the bank get money and give it to him and our, <laughs> the bomb would explode. So these are crazy stories you'd see in like weird movies from the 90s. This is how Pakistan was. So in the, and Nawaz Sharif at that time was considered less corrupt than Zardari, which is still true. Zardari is the master of all of that. Right. So, so Nawaz yeah, go ahead. started an accountability drive. But when Nawaz Sharif was pushed out, Musharraf came into power and Musharraf created this institution called NAB, National Accountability Bureau, that would um, that would investigate corruption of all politicians and bureaucrats. And, and, and then, Imran's, Imran's quote is really devastating here. He says, you know, NAB was controlled by the army. I couldn't do anything. They would say, yes, there are cases. We're working on it, but nothing would happen. I discovered that actually the establishment controlled NAB and proceeded as it wanted. It was to control politicians by having files about their corruption. They would squeeze someone, but then he would be out on bail. I just wanted to say, um, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm sure this is a pattern in other parts of the world, but when I was studying Afghanistan and talking to people in Afghanistan, they said that this was uh, one of the key things that Karzai uh, and successors did was they would develop files and blackmail on uh, the politicians they wanted to control. And I just couldn't help but think when I read this, I was like, well, you know, those a lot of a lot of the Afghan, uh, you know, dispensation, let's say, was installed by Pakistan intelligence. So it make, made sense to me that they would you know, have these same... Uh, we're uh, very practice. similar people, you know, even Pakistan, <laughs> India, and they, they're yeah. doing yeah. also very similar things. It's yeah. using all government machinery to find dirt on your opponent yeah. and yeah. then using that dirt to control them. It's pretty simple. Demo I guess if you have democracy, that's, <laughs> that's what you have to do. <laughs> yeah, so these people have uh, blackmail videos on judges yeah. on bureaucrats on generals they have files on everyone and once you have file on everyone that makes you really powerful why would they want someone per, uh, prosecuted if they can control them you know if you start prosecution that means you you've given away that power and control and this is not about yes. the people of pakistan this is not about the government this is not about democracy this is about power holding that power so within this whole Pakistani system, where everyone, everything was about power, if one guy comes in and says, you know, we have to think about taking these cases to their logical end to actually prosecuting them, then that guy is a problem because he's he's uh, destroying this whole system. So I don't know whether you might know better, but Imran is either in this interview uh, pretending to be dumb or kind of affecting a kind of naivete so he says he says at one point you know 
what about this army chief appointment issue? And he says, uh, I never thought about who the army chief would be in November. Why should I care if it's on merit? It should be the best person. It matters to the Sharifs and Zardari, but not to me. So, you know, he's trying to say, this is not my lane. I'm a democratic politician. The army appoints people based on merit. It's none of my business. What What's, uh, is that like, <laughs> what is this? Is he signaling to the army something? Is he, I don't know, maybe he you know, is, because yeah. that's not the correct answer. As <laughs> that's what I, I don't, I just, I, something, he's doing something here. It's just, I don't yeah, know what it is. Because the correct answer to this is, as the prime minister, he has the right to appoint an army chief, and he yeah. should appoint an army chief that is best for the country, and that is it. So uh, by saying these things, maybe he's like, the limitations of being in Pakistan and limitations of being a politician is that you cannot say all the things that you think. Yeah. So he yeah. might have considered someone for, for the army chief post. Uh, he might have liked someone better than the other. It's human nature. If someone says, I like all of you equally, that's never true, you know? It's, well, it's a yeah. I, I, statement. But he said that, so Faiz Hamid is the issue. And he says, you know, I knew him because I was working with him. Yeah. I'll take your recommendations. I was worried about Afghanistan. Yeah. ISI was telling me there would be civil war. I wanted General Faiz to stay until the transition. So this yeah. is all, you know, it's, it's very interesting because I, I'm always looking for the Afghan angle and it's clear that was a big part of it. Yeah. It was, uh, Faiz Hamid, it is uh, uh, accused that uh, Imran Khan liked Faiz Hamid more than the others. But there has been no evidence to this. You know, right, the, right. Imran Khan has not done anything that would put Faz Hamid in front of the others. He was the ISI chief, yes, but Imran Khan did not make him a lieutenant general to make him the ISI chief. He was given the, him as an ISI chief. Imran Khan is not his buddy from like childhood or anything. The thing is, maybe Faz Hamid was uh, more controllable to him or he could have a better working relationship with him at that time. What happened in October of last year is that ISI is this, basically, it, it, it is made of uh, all the three forces, but it is a civilian uh, intelligence agency. It reports directly to the prime minister. So uh, the ISI head reports to the prime minister, not the army chief, right? But the army chief, but even though he is uh, he is a man who's uh, from the army, the ISI chief is uh, from like he's detached he's detached to the uh, ISI from the army. Uh, so, in October uh, twenty twenty one, the army chief removed the ISI chief, which is something Imran Khan said he, uh, army chief should not be able to do. Army chief transferred ISI chief out to Peshawar and put him in another uh, ISI head. And at that time, Imran Khan, there was a there was a uh, struggle between like there was this tussle between Imran Khan and the army chief. Both had a big disagreement about this appointment, and that is where everything started, because uh, Imran Khan saw that the army chief, who is his inferior theoretically. And the chain of command, Imran Khan is above the army chief. The army chief refused to listen to Imran Khan. And eventually Imran Khan had to yield. The guy was transferred out and some other guy was transferred in. So this is where all the, the issues started. So Bajwa realized that this is not a guy who is going to listen to me. Bajwa also realized that this is a guy who might go out of power because his popularity is at all time low. Bajwa also realized at that time that the other parties will be extremely bad to him they were, when he retires. So in, in October 2021, if I look at the situation, if I am Bajwa, I would say, you know, Imran Khan is going out, he's on his way out, he's in a bad situation. I had helped Imran Khan in the past, and these people who are waiting outside for me, the two big parties, the two feudal parties, they're going to not leave me alone. So I need to placate them somehow. Imran Khan can go to hell. Can go. And then, so there's a little, the last uh, section of this article is actually a, a little bit like more like a electoral campaign <laughs> by, uh, by Imran Khan, where he says, you know, I really wanted to have electronic voting. I want to kind of secure the elections. The army wouldn't let me. 
And then he says a really interesting thing, which is that if he's elected again, he won't even bother uh, to take government if he doesn't have a majority. He says, if he faced the same situation with a razor thin majority, he would never take government. He says, we didn't have the power. This time, if I ever come, I will not take government if I don't have a majority and can't make a difference. If you have a coalition, a thin majority, and are being blackmailed by your own people, it's impossible to govern. That's when the army's role became more prominent because we needed their help and we were working together for the same cause. Again, very, um, very diplomatic language relative to the army. He says, and he concludes by saying it's idealistic. He means this in a bad way, clearly. It's idealistic, like, you know, it's not, it's not realistic to completely remove their role. They've been in power for so many years, but there needs to be a balance. To think the army will be shunted out of politics is not possible. Using their constructive power can get this country out of institutional collapse. So again, a kind of call to the army a little bit of like you guys can be reasonable if I can be or I can be reasonable if you guys are reasonable what do you how do you read those comments uh the first thing what was the first thing that you said before electronic voting electronic voting yes yeah. and the majority the razor thin majority part see yeah. if the army has files on every politician and if you have the majority of only four or five seats then when it comes to important legislation those files become really useful. You know, they, these people can switch sides whenever it is important. So every time this was supposed to happen, Imran Khan had to yield. And if you have to yield your power every time you're not in the government, basically what is uh, functionally happening is you get all the abuses from the people because people think that you are in the government and you get all the abuse, you get all the bad publicity, you get all the criticism and the people who are sitting in the shadows, they enjoy all the power. You enjoy none of that power. So it is not a great situation for a politician to be in. So I don't think this is exactly an electoral slogan. It is a real, uh, based on real uh, issues that Imran Khan or any government in Pakistan has. The government that is not powerful enough will keep on facing uh, yeah. these problems. Right, right. And the second, uh, what was the second part? Uh, the second part is just about how... Um... Sorry, it's a, I'm trying to find the article now. Did I close it? Uh, the, la the second part was about the army cannot be removed from politics. Yeah, this is also really sad in Pakistan. Yeah. One of the reasons is an army has put itself into this situation. It is because army is the strongest institution. Also, yeah. army is the strongest in institution because it has not let other institutions develop. So now... So say for example if you want uh yeah. if you want someone who has done something corrupt black and white if you want to punish them uh you want it investigated you won't you will not find a good investigator in pakistani all of pakistani police so right. you have to bring in the guys from the isi who know how to do investigation because that is the biggest institution in pakistan so you have to bring in the guys from the isi to do that investigation and this is a limitation it's not a, the best thing to say that you know we have to rely yeah. on the army the correct answer still here is that we will develop these institutions so we do not have to rely on the army but in the short run it seems imran khan is still going that way yeah some so there's some definitely some wrong answers here <laughs> yeah 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 um so what uh i mean so what, given that, right, given that he gives this thing where he says, you know, the army can't be removed from politics and uh, it should be, these appointments should be made by the army themselves, uh, all, of, all of these various things that he said that were pretty surprising, plus the fact that they shot him. Uh, what, I mean, where are things going? Is this gonna, is, is, he, is he trying to fizzle out? They, they portrayed him as defiant, but it didn't sound too, too defiant to me um not in this interview but he has been really defiant okay. in front of the public and many of the things he has said he has named people within the he has uh, named criminals so that has been unprecedented and def very defiant situation right now is so bad that imran khan is more popular than the army and army realizes this or has to realize this 
What is going to happen in the near future is that the current current army chief is now going to like the army today has officially announced that he has started his farewell visits. He's going to retire on 29th. Oh. The next army chief will come in. The next army chief, it is being said, would not like to inherit all these issues because right. the gulf between people and the army is huge. And Pakistani army is a, a, a big institution. It, it relies on the support of the people. If it does right. not have support of the people, this institution cannot survive for long. Right. So there, so maybe there, yeah. So again, if they, if they want to back off of this, they, they have a new chief of staff and then yeah. they ha- let an election happen, I guess. Yeah, they let an election happen. So this is what it looks like is going to happen because of things that have been avoided, this murder yeah. attempt has been avoided. Now it looks like we're partially almost out of the storm now. I'm not really sure because this guy who's going on Bajwa, he may or may not attempt something weird before the 29th, but it looks like he might not. We still have 20 days, almost like 19 days. Uh, so let's see. Uh, so Im- so if, Im- if I- so okay, so if I'm them, that's what I do. If I'm Imran Khan, maybe I just stay hang out at home for a couple of weeks. But then so, they think that Imran Khan is weak, then they, they won't announce anything. Then they won't announce. <laughs> you have yeah. to you have to keep up the momentum to actually force them to to do what they said they're yeah, going to Yeah, to make sure that they understand that this situation will not continue right. under current circumstances. There is only one, and it is a logical thing. There's only one way for this system to continue is to have elections, to have to get a fresh mandate yeah. from the people. No, or, they're, or they're gonna plunge into a whole a whole revolutionary situation. Yeah, again. And and the and right now the biggest thing that nobody is actually talking about is the economy. Every day economy gets from the bad floods, to, the the the, disa- the yeah. natural disaster. Everyone has forgotten about the fr- floods. There yeah. are there are there are villages that are still submerged as we speak, and everyone has forgotten about it. So there are real problems of Pakistan that are being ignored. As soon as the you know the political issues go away, economic issues will come to the forefront. Yeah. And what will happen then? The goal of a country is not to choose its prime minister repeatedly. <laughs> the goal of the country, a country is to have a better, you know, living standards yeah. for their population to look after the welfare of the people. Wow. Okay. Well, we're gonna have to check in uh again. I don't think this is uh this is definitely not the end of the line for this story. So stay tuned. I think we'll everybody. one more after the 29th. I think yeah. that yet. I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> yeah.